in a second. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned the uh, you mentioned the paper you mentioned. I just received today a uh, uh, just before we started the, um, uh, this meeting uh, an email from the American Sociological Review that somebody has uh, submitted a comment challenging the the findings of that paper. So uh, more to come on that. Uh, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know for you, for some of you in uh, Europe, it's it's already the late afternoon. Uh, for me here in California, it's uh, early morning. I hope my uh, my older daughter won't interrupt as she, as she wakes up and, and goes to school. Um, and um, indeed, uh, the work that I'm going to present to you today is um, work uh, that has been done collaboratively in the Computational Culture Lab uh, that um, I co-direct. Um, both at Stanford and uh, at uh, Berkeley University on the other side of the Bay Area and uh, San Francisco. So really all, all the work that you'll see today and basically all the work that I've been doing uh, in recent years uh, is uh, highly collaborative and dependent on this uh, great group of students, uh, collaborators um, who've been working uh, in the lab. And today I want to highlight in particular um, uh, both my co-director of the of the lab, Samir Srivastava, but especially Paul Vichananza, who I saw earlier here, uh, uh, is here today. He's waving his hand. You can tell by the by the San Francisco uh, background, uh, uh, Golden Gate background. Um, and Paul is really um, deserves all the kudos for this paper. He's been uh, the intellectual and the empirical uh, uh, leader of this. Uh, project, uh, so any accolades uh, uh, should go to him, and any criticisms uh, uh, should uh, should go to me. So, just in terms of um, um, you know the the process, um, I'm happy to kind of I've been already socialized in in a business school where um, the norm is uh, for kind of finance style um, uh, uh, seminars where it's difficult to get past your um, uh, introductory slide without having being asked like 500 questions. So silence for me is a is is a signal of lack of interest. But more but 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 uh, more sincerely, uh, you know, I'm happy to um, address questions uh, as they arise, especially if these are um, clarification questions. But even if these are kind of definitional questions, uh, I welcome you. Um, to ask um, uh, to ask those questions as they come up, we'll definitely have time at the end. So if you have larger, big picture questions, maybe those should be left uh, for discussion at the end. But if you uh, feel that you have a question that's relevant at the time, uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hand. And if I'm too kind of engrossed in in speaking, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. And I, I I'll uh, I'll be happy to uh, uh, you know take your question. Uh, as they come up, I think it's it usually makes for a better uh, type of interaction. So um, with that in mind, um, I want to uh, start uh, by introducing uh, uh, two individual, uh, two, two entrepreneurs. Um, I think the one on the left hand side is one that most of you will recognize in a very typical uh, uh, kind of pose to the camera. This is uh, Elon Musk. Um, uh, who I'm, I imagine uh, many of you know and recognize the CEO of, uh, of Tesla uh, and also now uh, uh, vac vaccination skeptic and, and other, uh, other social roles that he's playing. But roughly 15, slightly more than 15 years ago, um, Musk uh, was uh, uh, the first uh, investor in a small company at the time called Tesla Motors uh, that had this vision of moving uh, the world from dependence on the internal combustion engine to electric driven cars. Um, and you know, roughly at the same time, uh, about 15 years ago, the man who's uh, on the right hand side, Shai Agassi, also an entrepreneur, uh, had a very similar vision. Uh, uh, his vision uh, came in, in response to, um, I think it was um, uh, the economic forum, a question that was asked in the economic forum uh, in Davos. And uh, Agassi, very similar uh, to the vision that uh, powered uh, Tesla, uh, kind of imagined a world in which uh, cars will no longer be dependent on fossil fuel and um, a world in which transportation is, is entirely um, uh, driven through um, elect electrical power. Um, and, you know, very interestingly, the trajectories of the two companies, despite the fact that they had 
uh, at least at the outset, very similar ideas and visions for the future. Um, uh, Agassi's future was even, even more dramatic and, ambition, and ambitious uh, uh, than Tesla's. Uh, the trajectories of the companies were, uh, uh, as many of you probably know, especially for the first one, were quite different. Uh, Tesla's uh, uh, would become uh, a dramatic success, uh, making Musk uh, uh, occasionally uh, the richest man in the world, but amongst the richest people uh, uh, in the world, and his company has has grown significantly since, and its market capitalization now uh, is quite balloon relative to the amount of cars that it manufactures and delivers, uh, but it um, has overtaken companies like Ford uh, and uh, General Motors uh, several years ago already. Uh, whereas Better Place uh, was very um, um, unsuccessful in implementing its, its, um, its vision, uh, the company uh, was able to raise $850 million, uh, but the implementation uh, was problematic. Uh, in retrospect, um, there have been huge criticisms um, uh, in the way that the company uh, uh, implemented uh, its strategy. Uh, there were some uh, important uh, differences in, in, the, in the emphasis that the company did, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the kind of uh, the underlying vision that both companies had uh, were similar. Uh, but eventually, while Tesla was immensely successful, Better Place uh, filed for bankruptcy in 2013. Interestingly, after uh, being invested, uh, raising $850 million in investments, uh, the company was sold off for about for less than 1% of that value. So it was uh, uh, quite a colossal failure. Now, of course, the question of why Tesla was successful while Better Place uh, was uh, quite a disaster, even though they started with similar visions, is, is really interesting in its own right, but it's not the question that I want to uh, pursue today. Um, what I'm going to focus on is the question of, of vision, uh, uh, where it comes from uh, and, and who is more likely um, uh, to manufacture uh, a vision. By vision, I mean uh, the ability um, to imagine a future um, that fundamentally kind of um, challenges existing assumptions um, and logics of action in a particular field uh, at a given moment of time. Um, I started with an example um, from business, uh, but uh, we will be talking, uh, I will be giving you empirical examples both from law, politics, uh, uh, as well as, uh, as business, but the question of vision and where does visionary uh, thinking come from is pertinent basically to any form of uh, social interaction and human endeavor. I'm particularly interested in the moments in which people are uh, able to imagine um, a, a social future that's inherently uh, different from the future uh, that they operate uh, in uh, or the present they operate in it, uh, at the moment. But I think the example I gave you uh, and that I started with kind of uh, highlights uh, uh, two uh, important aspects of, of, of vision and our kind of tendency to think about vision that I think are, are problematic. First is that it's really important to recognize that uh, vision um, the ideation, the process of imagining a future is inherently different from the process of realizing that future. Uh, but the ways by which people have studied uh, vision uh, has often focused on the latter because we don't have access to people's thoughts, we have access to people's actions. And that leads us sometimes to uh, kind of select on dependent variable to learn from what people have done rather than thinking of, of what they're thinking and uh, uh, their imagination was. And a second thing that uh, the example uh, highlights is that there's a very big difference between the vision, the idea itself, and the person uh, who produces this vision. We tend to actually conflate the two, but as we saw with the example of Agassi and, uh, and Musk, uh, similar ideas originated in the heads of different people. In fact, for Musk, it wasn't his head that where it originated for, it was the founders of, of Tesla Motors um, who started with the idea. Um, and, and therefore we need to also kind of make the distinction uh, between um, uh, what the idea is and who is the person um, who generated and pursued this idea. And in the way the um, vision actually as a, as a social scientific construct has not been studied that much. There's been a lot of uh, research on innovation and creativity, but specifically the focus on the question of, of vision of this fundamental way of rethinking uh, a possible future uh, has been fairly uh, sparse. Uh, but when people have asked the question and, 
and, and ask themselves, uh, where does vision come from? The vast majority of the literature, uh, for example, recent work by Melissa Schilling um, has focused on, on the individuals and has tended to think about uh, vision as, as something that's innate and time invariant uh, and related to the um, uh, psychological capabilities of the individuals who uh, produce vision. So whether it was thinking about visionaries such as uh, Steve Jobs, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is an example of a visionary thinking in the law, or Martin Luther King, uh, clearly a visionary political thinker. Uh, the tendency is to kind of focus on the intellectual uh, capabilities, the ability to abstract, and the ability to think uh, uh, in ways that integrate knowledge uh, that are uh, rare and unique to certain people who are capable of, of, of um, uh, producing that type of vision. And I'm not going to challenge that at all. I agree very much that there is a variance between people in terms of how uh, they produce vision. Um, but the focus of our, of our study is to ask above and beyond these psychological differences and the innate capabilities that some individuals have in thinking in a visionary way, is as a sociologist to ask ourselves, how is the social position um, that an individual occupies uh, related to their capacity to produce vision and specifically um, uh, whether they occupy a central or peripheral um, uh, position in uh, the field that they're operating uh, in. And does that in some way afford advantages or provide disadvantages in their ability um, to deliver and produce visionary thinking? And, you know, as I said, the literature has not focused uh, that much on the question of vision per se, but, but, but a lot of research has been done about creativity and innovation. And existing literature kind of provides two grand overarching competing arguments about who is more likely um, to produce visionary thinking. There's one line of thinking um, um, that is also kind of popularly very much accepted when people think about uh, visionary business people, which is that a uh, vision should probably come um, from the periphery, from small actors um, who have had uh, a relatively less success until, until that point. Uh, and usually there are two types of arguments being um, uh, promoted there. One is uh, an issue of incentives and motivations that people on the periphery have stronger incentives to reimagine the present because they're not enjoying the benefits of the present. Uh, they have the um, incentives to kind of challenge the status quo. And a second argument is that uh, by virtue of occupying uh, the periphery, they often have access to ideas uh, that extend uh, beyond received visit, uh, vision. Um, or often it's just that they, they usually, there's a correlation between their peripheriality and the fact that they come um, from different kind of um, areas of socialization and therefore bring with themselves different ways of thinking of, of the problem at hand. And then it, um, a, a different line of work has kind of argued that actually vision should come from large established and central players. And the argument once again relates both to their incentives and their cognitive resources. The incentives part is about the fact that um, people who have status of power um, are often buffered from the risks of, of, uh, of of thinking outside the box. They usually are also kind of more entitled and have greater confidence uh, uh, to take these risks. Uh, but also from a cognitive perspective, they also have the resources to invest um, and access to new ways of thinking that uh, by virtue of the power and status that they occupy are often inaccessible um, uh, to people on, uh, on the periphery. So what I'd like to do today is to test this um, uh, uh, hypothesis, these two kind of competing hypotheses and spoiler alert, uh, I'll show you um, uh, that it is really uh, the former, the small and peripheral actors that are uh, across a variety of domains. We'll be looking at business, law and politics are systematically more likely um, to produce visionary uh, thinking relative to those who occupy uh, the center. So let me give you just a quick roadmap. This is actually a very complex um, uh, uh, study, both methodologically and in terms of its empirical setting because uh, we've tested our, our uh, methodology in three different settings. So what I'm gonna do today is uh, go uh, through defining what um, vision is. I'll, I'll define it as discursive prescience. We will be looking specifically in how people articulate their logics um, and as a, uh, a function of that, uh, I'll introduce a new method um, that is based on, on BERT, which is a natural uh, language processing um, uh, algorithm produced by 
uh, or a deep learning algorithm produced by uh, Google as a way to uh, operationalize this idea of discursive prescience. I'll show you a few validations uh, to kind of persuade you that what we're measuring is indeed what we're purporting to measure. And then to empirical uh, results, first I'll show you that uh, prescience is associated with success, another form of kind of validating uh, um, our measure, but also demonstrating to you that prescient actors do indeed reap rewards. And finally, kind of answering the questions that I started with, uh, to demonstrate to you that prescience comes from the periphery, whether that is uh, amongst business thinkers um, uh, and readers, amongst um, politicians, and amongst uh, judges, um, all of this um, uh, focus in the United States. So let's start with uh, looking at, at a kind of existing theories and, and what a, a kind of a taking stock of what existing literature uh, should tell us about where vision comes from and how one should approach it. And I think that the existing work uh, presents two types of, of limitations in, in, in thinking about vision and the source of visionary thinking. Uh, the first is a definitional problem. Um, uh, by which I mean, um, you know, the way by which people have um, um, kind of articulated vision has tended to focus either by equating vision with simply with novelty, so this idea that when you recombine ideas that hitherto have not been combined, uh, you're producing vision, or has focused uh, predominantly on the outcome. Uh, maybe one of the most permanent, uh, 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 prominent examples of that would be the theory of disruption. We know that something has been disruptive uh, when we see that it has disrupted uh, incumbents. And our argument is that actually what kind of makes ideas visionary rather than just novel is a combination of both of these aspects. So uh, we argue that uh, that vision has, has two components. Uh, the first component is this idea that it is innovative, but not just innovative in a, in a facile or superficial way. Uh, um, visionary innovations are fundamentally challenging the logic of action in the field in which they are operating. We refer to that as contextual innovation, uh, by which we mean um, that they really kind of reconfigure the context in which um, uh, the idea is operating it. And, and, and that innovation kind of uh, requires rethinking um, the interdependencies that the logic of the existing logic of action uh, prescribes. And the second aspect of, of uh, uh, vision is that it has to be prescient. It is not that it is, it, it is not enough for it to fundamentally reimagine the present. It also has to for, foresee how the field will evolve. It needs to be viable in some way. So visionary thinkers are ones who kind of challenge uh, the existing logic, but also uh, imagine a future that will eventually uh, become realized, whether it is themselves or others uh, will realize this. Uh, 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 an example I like to use, though I think it won't resonate that greatly within the European audience, and I have to admit myself as, a, as an Israeli, I never enjoyed or understood baseball, but I really like um, uh, uh, the book Moneyball and, 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 and uh, the film that was produced on its basis. The idea here was that now Billy Bean, the coach of a failing baseball team um, uh, around 20 years ago, kind of uh, starts reimagining what it means uh, uh, um, and how to play how to play the game. Um, and he realizes that traditional statistics around success and failure in hiring um, um, players uh, doesn't make sense. He uses this kind of data-driven cybermetic approach uh, to hiring uh, uh, players that are um, you know undervalued by the market. Uh, but that really is a function of him uh, inherently reimagining how the game is played and where success comes from. Eventually, um, uh, the Oakland A becomes a very successful um, um, team, almost winning the World Series. Of course, Americans uh, call something that happens in America as the World Series. Uh, uh, but uh, now I, I am American myself, so I shouldn't berate uh, uh, myself. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and that becomes, uh, is emulated by large players and then becomes his approach, his new strategy to, to baseball actually becomes uh, several years later commonplace and the kind of standard uh, in baseball. But, but Billy Bean is kind of the um, uh, quintessential example of a visionary thinker um, who reimagines the game, but also implements. Um, uh, and, and as I said, right, our focus is on the former, on the imagination, on the idea generation, and we want to separate that um, from um, the implementation. And that is precisely where the second uh, problem uh, usually comes from, uh, which is how does one go about and measure a vision? And the vast overwhelming majority of 
um, the literature that has focused on innovation and creativity has, has tended to study the final products, be those patents or songs or scientific publications, uh, et cetera, that people produce. Uh, but, but that um, uh, is a problem for two reasons. First of all, um, it fails to capture uh, this idea of contextual innovation. Often the products, sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't really embody uh, uh, the logic of action. Uh, so for example, the hiring decisions that Billy Bean uh, made in and of themselves gave us little insight to the underlying logic of, of uh, uh, the action and the strategy that he was pursuing uh, in baseball. Uh, so it's often very difficult um, um, to really infer uh, the logic from looking at the final product of action and how the logic was translated um, into, in, into products and into actions. And the second thing is that that kind of um, uh, approach of focusing on the product um, um, kind of pushes us to conflate success um, or action um, with the act of thinking and employing a vision. And, and I want to stress again that visionary thinking as we saw with uh, Shai Agassi is very different uh, from success. Uh, many successful actors were not visionary at all. And many visionary thinkers were either failed uh, to pursue their vision or didn't even try to do so at all. So by looking at the products that might lead us um, in the wrong direction. So based on the definition that I gave you, and in light of the problem of, of measurement that I uh, um, uh, showed you and, and kind of articulated in the last slide, in order for us to go about and measure vision in the way that I defined, um, we need to meet two types of criteria. We want to analyze people's descriptions of their logics, their articulations of their logics, rather than the products of their actions, and to apply a method that is attuned to this construct of contextual innovation uh, in, the, uh, in, in the way they speak. So how do they kind of recontextualize semantically um, the logic of action um, uh, that they're articulating? And to do that, as I mentioned, we'll be introducing a new method now that's based on, on, on a model developed by Google known as BERT, which I'll explain in a second. Now you might ask yourselves, really? Do we really read a new, new method? Because we're living in this age where every two days somebody um, introduces a new method. So it reminds me that once uh, early in my PhD, I heard a professor say that uh, on theories, that theories are kind of like toothbrushes Everybody has one and nobody wants to use somebody else's. Uh, I think we're all, uh, re, uh, living in a moment uh, that uh, methods are proliferating and, and changing so quickly that they've become kind of uh, the toothbrushes of our um, social scientific existence. Uh, so you should be, uh, you would be justified to challenge and ask, um, do we really need a new method? Why can't uh, we use existing already established um, uh, methods to, to measure vision in the way that you just defined. And um, I think that's a very valid point, uh, but I want to show you um, and argue that um, dominant and established, even if fairly recent uh, methodologies are limited for our purposes. I wanna highlight two kind of uh, already quite popular uh, methods in natural language processing. Uh, the first is topic models, which you know, I've used in the, in the computational culture lab. Uh, we've used quite a lot, for example, in analyzing glass door reviews. Um, topic models, for those of you who are familiar with them, take what's known as a um, bag of words approach. They treat a document as a collection of words, but completely disregard the sequence in which these words appear. Um, so that is actually has been demonstrated to be a fairly uh, powerful model in, in finding um, 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 the mixture of topics that are implicit in a document, but it is entirely context free. Uh, it doesn't um, in any way um, model the, um, uh, the logic of the argument that's being articulated in the document and would therefore be um, insufficient uh, for our purposes. Similarly, our word embedding models, which are a fairly even more recent innovation, but have already become quite institutionalized in um, you know, uh, the field of using natural language processing for social scientific purposes. Um, uh, word embedding models in and of themselves are already uh, fairly shallow, but nevertheless deep learning models um, that uh, take a continuous bag of words approach. So they don't only, they don't treat um, the document as just a, a, a probability distribution of words, but they also look um, at a word relative to um, uh, its adjacent words as they're being spoken. But nevertheless, the model is inherently <clears throat> context-free. Um, it assumes 
uh, a singular language model. So what um, word embeddings, for those of you who are familiar with them, what they're very good at is that they take a large corpus of text, um, they kind of translate that corpus into a uh, hyper dimensional space and they locate each word in, um, in that semantic hyper dimensional space in a way that appears to be very similar to how um, um, humans um, construct meaning. And then words that are very close to one another in that space tend to have very different uh, similar meanings. The problem is that it is context free. So imagine uh, to use a word that's very um, uh, pertinent in our era, a word like shot, right? In, the, in, in English, shot could mean receiving a vaccine, could mean a, a shot that some a basketball player is, is uh, taking a shot at the basket or um, uh, a shot could be a gunfire shot, right? Um, um, a word embedding model won't be able to um, discern those different ways by which a multivocal world is being used. And that is precisely what we would like um, uh, to figure out how a no uh, an idea is being used in a way that's contextually novel. So for that purpose, um, a word embedding model won't be enough. So what we use is um, an, an, a new, um, uh, significantly more complicated um, uh, language uh, model known as BERT, which actually builds on word embedding models. Uh, BERT, which stands for bidirectional encoder representations uh, from transformers, uh, was an innovation that was introduced by Google uh, roughly two or three years ago. Um, Google has now integrated BERT into its own search engine. Um, BERT um, introduced a few important um, uh, innovations. One was uh, that it is a bidirectional bi model, uh, namely um, it doesn't really look at um, uh, you know, the sequence in which um, the word is being uh, presented, but rather looks at the context in which it is uh, being spoken in a bidirectional way. The way it does that is by using a mass prediction task. So it looks at a sentence and it masks a word or a, a percentage of words in that sentence. And in light of the other words that are known in the sentence, it, it is being trained to predict what the masked words are going to be. Um, uh, it uses also a variety of layers uh, that have uh, you know, specifically something known as the attention mechanism that gives greater weight to certain words, uh, but um, it also helps with parallelization of of the process, but uh, uh, specifically for our purposes, what it does is it can kind of process sentences as a whole, uh, but also not only um, a, a given sentence, but also um, um, kind of understanding a sentence in light of the sentence that preceded it. Um, the model is extremely complex. It has upwards of 100 million parameters. Um, to be honest, Nobody fully understands the black box of what is being represented there, uh, but the people who've studied the properties of the, of the model have demonstrated that it appears to represent things that are consistent with syntax trees so, and, and, and higher order um, uh, representations of context. So the model um, in the way that it quote unquote learns syntax and semantics represents this contextual knowledge that is inherent for us uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to model um, uh, contextual innovation in the way that uh, I identified before. Really, the idea is that the model, if I were to anthropomorphize it, it can give it some sense of humanity. It really understands and learns English and then reads a text and tries to um, kind of represent the text, a context in which it is spoken uh, and, and really understand whether if somebody's talking about shots, what they're talking about is receiving a vaccine or whether they're talking about um, um, violence um, and, and, and shootings. And um, um, you know, the way that it has been used um, in most models is to kind of uh, use it as a, as a prediction, as a downstream prediction test. That's how um, um, Google uses it in, in its uh, search engine. Uh, but our focus is, is to kind of uh, take advantage of this um, a mass language model. Um, and um, you know, this idea that uh, when you mask a word, the model can then uh, kind of um, make predictions of what is the most likely word that is being masked in light of the context in which it is being spoken. So to kind of once again humanize it, um, the model understands the logic of the sentence and makes a prediction of what the masked word is going to be in light of that logic. We exploit that to ask, well, if somebody is then introducing a word 
that is very unlikely to be introduced in light of the context in which it is spoken, we argue that is a contextually novel introduction. They're using that word in a way um, that is unexpected by the model that is inconsistent with the way um, other speakers and how English is being uh, uh, spoken at, at this contemporary moment. So how do we do that? Um, we introduced this measure of perplexity. And by the way, you know, um, BERT is not strictly speaking in, in linguistic terms, a language model per se. So it, this is not strictly speaking a measure of perplexity, but conceptually it is the same thing. We use the mass prediction task um, in order to evaluate how it unexpected a word is, right? Where y hat here uh, represents uh, BERT's estimate of the word, of, uh, of the likelihood of the word I in light of all the other words that have been enunciated in that sentence and in light of the sentence uh, that preceded it. Um, we kind of, uh, this is known as the exponentiated cross entropy loss, but it's basically um, the exponentiated uh, negative uh, log of, of, of the likelihood that's being inferred by BERT. And that is the measure of perplexity. We should understand that as the inverse probability of a word given a context, the higher perplexity, the more surprising the word is in light of the context in which it is being enunciated. Um, we then measure contextual novelty as the product of word perplexities in the sentence, um, normalized by the length of the sentence. So basically each sentence gets a measure of perplexity. And now here it comes the most uh, kind of, I think most important kind of innovation or the use, our use of the, of the BERT model um, um, to um, um, get at this idea that vision in here is both in contextual innovation, but in prescience and the ability to foresee the future, we introduce, we translate um, a perplexity into this measure of uh, what we call discursive prescience, which is the percentage loss in perplexity in the future relative to the time the sentence is being spoken. So what we do, and I'll explain this in a second in more detail, we fine tune the BERT model to the present, and then we fine tune it to the future. And then we ask, how surprising was the use of this particular term in this particular context, surprising at time t relative to how surprising it would have been if it would have been spoken at t plus one. And the greater that relative surprise, the more prescient that is. So high perplexity sentences are unexpected when they're spoken, they're perplexing at the time that they're spoken, but they become more commonplace in the future. So one example I'll show you from, uh, once again, from business, from the business realm, uh, when people um, um, in the early 2010s, um, when they used to say the word onboarding, onboarding in American business parlance, traditionally was used uh, for the idea of onboarding um, employees into a firm. Um, roughly 10 years ago, it's starting being used to represent the onboarding of customers. But the imagination, right? What is the kind of a, the visionary logic here is to think about onboarding customers in the same way to your product in the same way that you onboard employees, you socialize them into your product. And we find um, that people who kind of thought and use the term onboarding as one just such example um, um, uh, like that in the 2010s were very prescient. Now, again, we're not focusing on one word. We look at the average of words uh, that people use um, throughout um, uh, um, you know, the speeches um, that we're going to measure. So uh, to visualize the process, just to once again, kind of show you what we're doing. Imagine that, that this is an example of a sentence that was being spoken in a quarterly earnings call, which are our data that I'm going to analyze. Um, um, so this is a sentence, we tokenize the sentence um, um, and um, you know, we then kind of load the uh, uh, mask language uh, model, uh, we mask, uh, several words and, and kind of look at these two different models. Um, this is Burton 2011 when onboarding was used in a, in a more kind of employee socialization way relative to five years later. Um, we apply both models. We calculate the perplexities of each word. How surprising is each word in light of the uh, sentence that it's being um, uh, enunciated in? Um, we calculate the word perplexities as I just show you. Uh, we multiply the word complexities to calculate the overall sentence um, um, perplexity and normalize it by the length of the sentence. And then we can come up uh, with a sentence prescience, which is the percentage loss in perplexity. In this case, uh, it's a fairly high percentage loss. Um, and therefore, uh, we conclude that this sentence was 
prescient at the time in which it was spoken. And then we can average across all sentences in the document and aggregate uh, by the unit of analysis that we want um, uh, to analyze. So that is the model and that uh, I'm going to use. Are there um, any questions um, uh, before I, I move on to showing its empirical um, application? And I'll take the opportunity to drink some water. I see intrigued but bemused faces. So um, if there are no questions, uh, I think oh, there, there are, are questions. Yeah, there, there are. are. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't see it. Oh, Francois, go ahead. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can, yes. 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 Um, yeah. I'm just. I, I'm only familiar slightly with word embedding, so I'm. I'm trying to think. Okay, I could have two word embeddings at two different points in times and see that for two different speakers and see that the, the proximity of the words, I suppose it's a very standard question is just to, to understand. Right. So um, I, that's a great question, but you know, usually word embeddings are not produced by um, one speaker. They're trained on the corpus in its entirety. True. So what they represent, so the assumption is, is that the language model is shared by all the speakers. So if a word has changed, so for example, we find that the word gay, you know, meant something very different in the early 20th century relative to the late 20th century when it became, um, uh, represents um, sexual identity, but that was shared by all people. So uh, I wouldn't be able to identify that with respect to, um, um, uh, to, one, to one speaker. Um, even if I, if I can, um, um, you know, and, and there are ways to fine tune the model, but that depends on high, um, on high volume uh, to fine tune it to speakers. Still, what I would identify there is perhaps a unique speaker's interpretation of a specific word. But what I want to understand is not just whether the word, you know, somebody started using the word gay differently earlier than others. It is, has, has that person used a specific word in a context, in a very different way, kind of arrange the context. And our assumption here is that uh, when somebody is talking about onboarding in a specific way, um, it's not just that they're reinterpreting um, onboarding, they're reinterpreting the process of introducing uh, users into your, into your product in that example. And, and the advantage of BERT is that it is very heavy on modeling the context and trying to understand the context. It is very, it has so many parameters because these layers represent the different contexts that are being inferred. And that's precisely what we're trying to get at, which is not captured by well, the word embedding model. Thank you for that um, question. Um, Javad, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, yes, you pronounce it pretty good. I mean, so uh, th thanks for the talk so far. My question is, can you Sorry, hear me? I can't hear you. Now I can hear you. Okay. Sorry, yeah, my Zoom had a problem, sorry. So you are looking into the relative change in the, how, you know, uncommon a, a sentence is in a, you know, in a context or, or sorry, in right. a document. So what if it's still unexpected or rare in future? That doesn't mean it's not visionary. It still might not be in real life. So why don't we look also at the absolute value yeah. of uh, how unexpected right. something is? That, that's a great question. But you know, based on our definition, we kind of require two components for, for something to be visionary. It's not enough for it to be unexpected in the present. It also needs to be prescient to foresee the future, right? So it, it our assumption is that um, you know it's very easy to introduce, or it's not that easy, but anyone could reimagine the future. The question is, do you yeah. reimagine the future in a way that is viable that can be realized? And and that's and that's um, uh, you know inherent to our definition is that the idea that a visionary speaker or a visionary thinker is visionary not only insofar as that they were able to fundamentally un challenge the assumptions of the present, but they were able to imagine a future that will in eventually um, uh, become realized, whether they were the ones who realized it or not. So that's so an important are, component. And so I agree you with you. So you are incorporating success yes. in it. So without success- I'm not the, incorporating success. I, I it will not I'm become incorporating the success of the idea. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. It's but true. But what I'm incorporating is 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 the success of the idea, not of of the person, right? Yes. Um, I am defining future. Uh, uh, sorry, vision is the ability to reimagine a future that will eventually become realized. That's an important definition. I mean, you might disagree with me about the definition, and we can talk about that later. But for sure. but but it's an important distinction to be made. Thank yes. you for for, Thank for you. that clarification. So with that in mind, I want to kind of show you how we, we apply this in two different and sorry, three different settings, as I mentioned, in politics, in law and um, uh, in business. Let me describe uh, the data for you a little bit. Uh, so in politics, uh, uh, we use uh, the full United States congressional record. This was collected by Matt Jensko and his collaborators um, uh, here in the um, uh, economics department at Stanford. Uh, we focus on, on uh, the years 1961 to 2017 for a variety of reasons. Uh, we segment the data into four year intervals corresponding roughly, uh, not roughly, but corresponding to presidential terms. And we compute prescience as time T relative to the mean of our uh, word perplexity at time uh, and the average between time T plus one and T plus two. So basically a speaker speaks in 1960 and then we look at the average between the period 1964 to 68 and 1968 to 1972. And that's how we measure that speaker's impressions. Our unit of analysis is the individual. We aggregate across politicians at every time interval. Um, in law, we use um, a digitized uh, data set known as the Case Law Access Project, which is a project that digitized um, uh, federal and state rulings. Uh, once again, we focus on, on uh, roughly the same period in 1960 to 2010. We have roughly 4 million cases. Here we segment the data into five-year intervals. Uh, sorry, that's a mistake. Not corresponding to presidential terms. Uh, that's a leftover from the previous slide. Uh, we remove in-text citations so that there won't be um, we won't be estimating the pressions on the basis of, of um, rulings that are being decided, uh, that are being uh, cited. Uh, and once again, prescient is computed as time t relative to the mean of time t plus one, t plus two. So we look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg's ruling if she was the one who wrote a ruling in 1996 and then compare it to 2001 and 2006 and see whether what she wrote in 1996 uh, was prescient relative to when she was speaking and relative to the uh, uh, to the future. And here, uh, rather than aggregating at the individual, we look at the individual ruling. Like rulings in the in American courts, even if they were done at the Supreme Court, um, uh, the decision was voted by multiple um, uh, uh, judges. Eventually, uh, there usually is only one judge who actually writes uh, the decision, and we associate that decision with that individual. Finally, we look at quarterly earning calls, the far smaller data set. Um, here, um, the quarterly earning calls are calls that uh, most uh, publicly traded firms, they're not required, but they traditionally do that on a quarterly basis with analysts. Uh, we focus on the uh, Q&A portion only, uh, usually the structure of a quarterly earning call that's done by, by, by top executives, uh, often the CEO, chief uh, uh, financial officer, et cetera. Um, we look only at the Q&A portion because that's a less contrived and more open kind of free text uh, interaction. Um, here, we only folk, uh, we don't have um, uh, multiple observations of, of firms and individuals. We only look at uh, eventually at, the, at the, uh, the year 2011 relative to 2016. Um, the reason being that before 2011, during the height of the financial crisis, there was too much um, uh, disruption for us to estimate the models properly. And we don't, uh, there aren't many um, uh, transcripts of quarterly earning calls preceding 2006. Um, so we focused only on uh, one snapshot comparing 2011 um, to five years later in 2016. So what is our procedure, right? Once again, we process uh, the data, we tokenize words and parse sentences. Um, importantly, we fine tune BERT for our particular context and for the particular interval. So we really kind of, Con we we um, uh, create different models that are fine-tuned um, for you know, um, legal decisions in the interval of 1960 to 1965, um, and then legal decisions from 1965 to or from 1966 to 1971, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so that we can compare word complexities in the way that I showed you earlier. We compute, compute uh, sentence level oppressions. We average by the document, whether that's a political speech, 
uh, judicial ruling or a quarterly earnings call. And we aggregate it by the unit of analysis that we're interested in, whether it's an individual ruling, um, uh, the speeches of a particular um, um, politician over a particular time interval, or we average all the quarterly earning calls that a company did over, over a year. Um, so let me show you uh, um, that, um, try to kind of validate that what we're measuring is indeed uh, what we call discursive prescience. Now, of course, when you have uh, a black box algorithm that has an upwards of 100 million parameters, it's not that there isn't one clear, simple statistic with which uh, we can uh, validate that it's measuring what we believe that it's measuring. Um, so um, for our purposes, uh, we will show you a few kind of intuitive examples that I think cohere with, with what we would expect or intuitively believe our prescient um, speeches and spe uh, uh, prescient um, uh, ways of thinking. Uh, so one way of thinking about it, even though, as I said, you know, this is a context heavy model that doesn't only look at a specific word like, I, like in, in, in the question that Francois had, but looks at um, um, uh, the context uh, in which the word is spoken and aggregates at the level of the sentence. Uh, it's important to, to say that because we're not just looking at one kind of unusual use of a word, we aggregate it at the document level. So a prescient document is one in which the speaker is using words in contextually novel ways on average all the time. Um, uh, but still looking at specific words um, helps us with our kind of limited human cognition uh, to get a grip on what, what's happening. So uh, these are examples of least and most prescient words in um, uh, the different domains. So not surprisingly, for example, in politics, you know, people, um, this is, uh, we look at 1980s uh, relative um, uh, to the uh, 2010s. So it's not surprising that, for example, people who are still talking about the Soviets in the 2010s uh, were no longer with the times. Um, when you look at law, a lot of the prescience in, in the early 1980s comes from decisions that were around um, uh, new technologies, databases, um, um, optimization, et, et cetera, um, and um, kind of reinterpreting these new technologies. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the single most um, a prescient word by which the word that contributes most to document prescience in the business context is this word onboarding. Uh, which represented a shift in how people understood uh, their um, um, a product and their company's interaction uh, with their users, kind of imagining them like they imagine employees that need to be um, socialized. And not surprisingly, you know, uh, all technologies uh, that were, you know, um, becoming outmoded in the 2011, like DVDs or CDs, uh, uh, those who uh, were, were kind of least contributors uh, to pressions uh, in, in our model. Um, you know, uh, still looking at the business, um, oh, if we look at different types of firms that we should expect them to be prescient. So if we look just at uh, industry classifications, we see that mining, utilities and construction, these kind of uh, fairly traditional and not uh, very innovative industries uh, tend to be the least prescient. The most prescient are professional services, which also include uh, information technology firms as one would expect. And when you look at the least and most prescient firms, really on the left-hand side are technologically innovative firms. On the right-hand side are old school um, uh, industrial firms. Some of these firms have actually been in existence for more than a hundred years. Surprisingly, you might ask yourself, how come Netflix is in that mix? Some of you might be, recall that in 2010, Netflix was very much struggling with the strategy. It was trying to keep its DVD business while moving into streaming. Um, it was actually heavily criticized by analysts at the time as implementing a backward facing strategy when it um, shifted uh, uh, or introduced two um, uh, pricing models for its streaming and for its um, uh, DVD business. Um, even though Netflix now is one of the most successful companies, um, in 2011, its, its stock dropped by about 75%. It was seen as being stuck in the past rather than looking at the future. And our model um, was able to capture that um, in 2011. I'm pretty sure that had we modeled it in, in, in later years, uh, we would have found something um, uh, inherently different. But I think the best examples of validation come from um, uh, pol political discourse. Um, I want to highlight in particular two politicians from um, Democrats um, who are operating in, at the height of the 
uh, civil, um, civil rights movement in the United States. One, James Eastland, who is a kind of old school classical um, uh, white segregationist who unabashedly um, talked about his perceptions of African Americans as an inferior race. Um, um, and, you know, as you see here in this quote, kind of um, being surprised at this idea um, uh, that whites and, and blacks could be seen as equally law-abiding. Um, his language was actually more offensive, but I, I didn't, I didn't share all the offensive language with him, uh, with you. And juxtapose uh, uh, him with a, a politician, uh, a congressperson uh, like John Stennis, um, who is, is generally seen as the progenitor of the kind of colorblind narrative in American conservative discourse around race. So it's no longer this uh, idea that. Uh, segregation is justified by the inferiority of other races, but the argument is being drawn as as kind of um, uh, you know justified from the point of view that um, everybody has the same uh, rights. We don't want the federal government to intervene, um, and you know a race shouldn't matter uh, rather than uh, 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 than it being inherently uh, important. Uh, Stennis is is generally um, uh, considered as kind of the um, progenitor of colorblind. Um, a conservatism that is the mainstay of, of conservative kind of racialized discourse in America uh, at the moment. If you were look, if you were to look at Stennis and Eastland's voting history, you would find that their positions on um, civil on the civil rights were almost identical. So in terms of how they behaved, they look very similar. But the way they construed um, uh, uh, the logic of their position, um, they were inherently different. And interestingly, we indeed find that while Stennis is the most prescient politician in our data set, Eastland is the least most prescient. Eastland is, is, is talking racial politics all of the 1940s, and Stennis is talking in the 1960s racial politics that will become commonplace amongst um, conservative speakers by the 1990s and 2000s. In fact, one of these uh, conservative politicians was a revolutionary in his own right, um, uh, Gingrich, Newt Gingrich, uh, who emerged in the scene in the late 70s um, with a whole bunch of senators known as the Gingrich senators who really kind of focused or refocused um, um, uh, the narrative of the, of, of the Republican Party um, from you know, traditional kind of American um, conser uh, fiscal conservatism um, to focus on the culture wars, being very aggressive and obstructionist towards democratic uh, leaders and presidents and uh, being very also uh, kind of violent and, and aggressive in pursuing um, um, uh, policies. As you can see here, you know, very much Donald Trump is a product of, of the logic that was introduced by Gingrich and his colleagues in the uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s in the United States. And as you see, the Gingrich senators are very much um, uh, more prescient than uh, all other uh, Republican uh, senators uh, at the time in a way that's very consistent with what political scientists recognize as um, uh, their contribution to political discourse. I want to highlight, uh, the, by the way, that we consulted a lot of experts in the various domains. Uh, we talked to political scientists from Justin Grimmer, who is an expert on textual analysis of con uh, congressional speech, uh, to Jack Rakoff, who's a historian of uh, American politics. Uh, we also um, uh, consulted legal scholars uh, to that you know that the examples and 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 the ways that we're measuring um, uh, prescience in these domains are consistent with these experts' uh, expectations. The last thing I'll say is that the immediate reaction in the legal uh, realm would be to say, okay, let's look at landmark decisions. But it turns out that landmark decisions by the Supreme Court are landmark often because um, of their immense impact on the way um, that a particular domain operates, but often uh, they kind of cohere um, uh, vision, the narratives that have been introduced uh, many years prior by, by others. Uh, and the example of Brown versus the Board of uh, Education, which kind of struck down the separate by equal uh, doctrine in the 1950s, which was a cornerstone of the uh, civil rights movement, um, was actually the argument that it was based on uh, was introduced uh, 15 years uh, or almost 20 years earlier uh, by Thurgood Marshall, who would uh, eventually become the first um, uh, black Supreme Court justice in the United States, uh, was accepted by the Maryland uh, Circuit Court in 1930s, was then reaffirmed by the Maryland Court of Appeals. And we actually find that that's a common pattern. And what we find we see is that lower courts introduce visionary uh, thoughts, 
But it's only when then those are accepted by the Supreme Court that they become the law of the land. And that's why they are a landmark decision. But the fact that a landmark decision is a landmark decision um, doesn't necessarily mean that it was visionary. Often uh, the idea uh, was generated earlier by somebody else. So with that, um, and I'll, I'll see if there are any questions on validations before I, I, I move on to the last section of empirical application. Take some an opportunity to drink a little bit. So I see there are no questions, I think. Um, so let me show you um, uh, in the final uh, uh, portion of this presentation, I wanna show you two things. First, I wanna show you um, um, kind of what are the downstream correlates of pressure that prescient actors, those that have uh, introduced visionary thinking are more successful in their respective domains in a way that would be consistent with our expectations. Not all visionaries are successful, but there should be a correlation between being um, oppression and being successful, especially if, um, as Javad uh, mentioned earlier, right, if our, if our definition of, of vision is to imagine a contextually novel idea that eventually becomes novel, uh, a commonplace, then you would expect that uh, people who have had that capacity are going to uh, enjoy the success of doing so downstream. And then in the second stage, I will try to answer the question of where does vision come from to show you that it comes from the periphery. So. Um, how do we measure success in politics? We look both, there are two kinds of audiences, the electorate and your own peers. Uh, so we look at, at the linear probability of being reelected. Uh, being reelected. Uh, we also include retirements because it's known that people retire mostly when they think they're not likely uh, to win uh, a race. And we also look at peer recognition at the committees that you're appointed to. And we um, use a conventional measure of committee status uh, from committee flow. The assumption is that committees that people flow into but not out of are the higher status committees. And we look at your kind of career achievement as the committees that you're appointed to. Um, so this is kind of, this is just, I won't go into the details of the model, but to show you, um, you know, we measure pressions both um, averaging it at a particular time, but also um, averaging it on, uh, on your career up until that point. Um, and as you can see, uh, prescience is, is associated with our uh, outcomes in, in various types of models where we also include um, uh, controls that you would expect. Um, I wanna show you just the size of, of, of the effect here, right? Um, the likelihood of re-election as a function of your prescience, holding constant um, your political party, the time and the year in which um, and, and most people get reelected, by the way. It's quite surprising to see that actually most congressional races are not challenged. Um, but um, the bump is significant. Um, if, if important uh, races in the United States, as we saw, are being decided on, on the basis of one or two percentage points, then the two percent, uh, roughly four percentage point advantage of, of prescience here could be immensely consequential um, for one's um, political prospects. And here we see uh, that you know um, your career achievement obviously increases with time, but when we differentiate between high and low pressions politicians uh, by looking at the tertiles of, of pressions that they're in, um, the high pressions politicians are more likely um, uh, um, to reach um, uh, high status committees holding other things constant relative to the low pressions. Um, once again, the percentage points are quite significant. So pressions gives you uh, rewards both with respect to your peers and to the electorates. Now, when we move to looking at the law, and here we're looking at within person models. Um, uh, so we're looking at, right, um, holding constant uh, fixed judge characteristics, holding constant time and court characteristics when we look at uh, the differences between prescient and, and less prescient decisions, um, uh, both looking at their log citations, the amount of uh, impact that they have, um, also dichotomizing it um, by looking at the Supreme Court only and the differentiating landmark decisions as those that are at the 95% of, of citations. Once again, we see a, a significant effect here, right? Um, the standardized prescience is, is uh, translated into a significant increase in your citations and a significant increase in the, in the likelihood that you will have a landmark decision by which we just mean uh, that you will be at the top 5% uh, highest cited uh, Supreme Court decisions. Again, this is within the Supreme Court uh, only, um, more prescient decisions are more likely um, to be cited. Um, and finally, uh, in business, um, we look at annual returns uh, for the stock of a company whose um, a CEO or executive is being prescient. 
And once again, we see um, that these are correlated um, uh, with prescience um, um, while including you know, other controls into account and even um, uh, putting um, industry fixed effects. We saw that there's a lot of variance between industries in terms of prescience, so we control for that. And once again, we see that the import, uh, um, this is uh, significant. Uh, there's almost a 20% um, increase in uh, returns for stocks um, of companies whose speakers are prescient. Importantly, we noticed uh, that the benefits as prescient are uh, immensely concentrated at the top. So if we divide here into different percentiles, we see that the you know, companies that really reap the rewards of their prescience are the ones that at, uh, are at the 95% percentile of pressure. So it's really, you know, executives who really don't just introduce one idea, present idea, but who consistently speak in a prescient way um, relative um, uh, to their competitors at the time who are most likely um, to reap the rewards of this prescience. And that kind of, um, and, you know, we also find that this is correlated with other forms of success. These companies grow in assets, their earnings per share grow, even controlling for um, their earnings per share and their assets at the time prior, their sales, even the size of the company grows. Um, we have huge limitation here on the size of the samples. Uh, we, at, at certain places, we only have uh, a few hundred. Uh, so the effects are not, uh, you know, dramatically statistically significant, um, but the coefficients are quite, quite large. Uh, so, you know, to conclude, we see that prescient actors benefit from their prescience if they are able to articulate uh, 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 imagine a, a future that will eventually become uh, realized, as you would expect, um, um, they benefit from that. But you know, the most important question that we were interested in is, well, well, if that is the case, where does vision come from? Does it indeed come from the periphery, as, you have, as, as I have argued? And here we dichotomize, um, especially based on what we saw in the last example with um, um, business domain and the fact that business, uh, that prescience and the benefits of prescience are concentrated at the top, we define visionaries as those who are at the 95 uh, percentile of prescience in all of their settings. And we try to model, right? We model who is a visionary by looking at whether they do indeed reach that level of prescience um, at a given moment uh, of time. We do that for all settings. And I'll show you in a second that indeed um, these prescient speakers come from the periphery in all settings. So the vision advantage in politics, uh, we measure one centrality in the political realm. Once again, we use a fairly established um, a measure um, uh, by looking at your centrality in the uh, Bill Cone sponsorship network. The idea is that you know, uh, Congress people um, can sponsor bills that they introduce um, uh, to the floor uh, with others. And it has been established that people who um, co-sponsor with others and are central in the network of co-sponsorship, uh, um, it, it, it is highly correlated uh, with their status and power inside the Senate. So you would expect a Mitch McConnell, right, the leader of the Senate up until recently, um, uh, to have high, uh, to have co-sponsored uh, bills with many people and to occupy a central position and for more marginal, um, uh, like, you know, when um, Alexandria Ocasio-Ortez was introduced into Congress, um, she was um, more on the margins uh, of, of her party's um, ideology, um, and you would expect her uh, to be more on the margins of the network of uh, Bill Coe's sponsorship. And whether we implement um, uh, or operationalize centrality as degree or eigenvector, I'm, I'm assuming that many of you, uh, given my familiarity with IAS and the audience, would be familiar with these types of measures. But these are different ways of kind of network operationalizations of centrality. Whatever way of operationalizing centrality, we find that it is um, highly correlated with being a visionary speaker, even while accounting for the status, the, uh, that, uh, the committee status that you occupy, so your career achievement. Um, we also, in the last model here, we also look at uh, just at your experience, uh, how many years you've been in Congress. We see that um, it is negatively correlated with um, uh, being a visionary. The idea here is that it's the younger, you know, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who, Cortez who introduced visionary speaking rather than the Mitch McConnells of this world. This tapers off as time goes by, we have a quadratic effect, um, but it's really the young speakers um, who introduce, so the inexperienced and the less central speakers who introduce uh, novel um, uh, visionary ideas. Um, here visualizing the um, marginal effect, 
we see that it's quite uh, dramatic. The likelihood of being a visionary speaker drops from roughly eight and a half uh, to one and a half percent as a function of your network centrality is a quite a dramatic uh, effect um, holding uh, these other things constant. Yes, Francois. Yeah, so it, it's good for being reelected and being appointed to a committee, but yes. I know you mentioned Mitch McConnell, maybe these visionary speakers are not very good or not able rather than very good to get uh, to push legislation, right? There's this measure of legislative effectiveness. So it's, it's, I think it would be interesting, actually. It would be, I, I think it's a great question. But again, we're interested less in the question of like, how do they translate it into success and more of where, do, where does the visionary thinking come from? I, I agree with you. It's a, great, it's a great proposal to kind of, uh, you know, in a next stage of this research program, we would like to unpack the process that connects the introduction of a visionary idea and the ability to reap the success. But really the focus now that I am is, is, is on the introduction of, of the idea, but thank you for that um, uh, comment. Um, in the law, um, and I think here are the results are, are, are perhaps most interesting because here we have quite a lot of data and we also can introduce um, a judge fixed effects. So we can look not only at where comparing the Ocasio Ortezes, uh, right, or the Ruth Bader Ginsburgs of the world to other judges, but we can see what happens to Ruth G uh, Bader Ginsburg as she progresses in her career over time. And, you know, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the structure of the American court system, basically there are two court systems the state and the federal level, each has three kind of levels generally the trial courts, the appellate courts, and the Supreme Courts. So there's a hierarchy within each domain, the state and the federal, and generally the federal is, is superior um, uh, to the state level. And what we see here in the first model, when we look at visionary decisions, is generally the state, and here the omitted category is the US Supreme Court, are significantly more visionary than the US Supreme Court, but even at the federal level, the appellate and the district courts, the trial courts, are significantly more um, uh, prescient than, um, um, the um, uh, federal courts, when we compare um, uh, different types of judges and we look specifically at two interesting kind of um, uh, aspects of their pedigree. Uh, some of you might not know this. I, I just discovered this, uh, uh, introduced this idea recently when we started doing this research. It turns out that the vast overwhelming majority of Supreme Court judges in the United States were trained either in Yale or in Harvard. Currently, all American Supreme Court judges were trained in Yale or in Harvard except for one that I'm proud to say was trained at the Stanford uh, Law School. Um, uh, but generally it's, it's, it's known that um, the two, these are the two elite schools. And, and you know, there's also high st status is being confirmed by clerking um, in your early career with a Supreme Court judge. We find that both of these are negatively associated with being visionary. So people who were trained in elite institutions or who were socialized and trained by elite uh, Supreme Court judges are uh, all other things being equal, the least ones to produce vision. And finally, um, at this federal level, we, can, we also have high granularity in judges. So here we have a model that also includes judge fixed effects. So we can look at the effect of transitioning from one court to another, um, right? So this really holds constant any types of psychological individual differences in people. And we see that once again, uh, uh, the effect is negative um, um, as you go up in the chain of the status of, of the courts to visualize the effects, right? The state courts are dramatically more um, uh, prescient um, discursively than the other courts, but even in the state level, in the federal level, you see a, a, uh, that the Supreme Courts are inherently less prescient. I, I have to tell you that when we introduce this to legal scholars, they say this is a very provocative statement. So when you talk to like strategy professors and they say, yeah, we all knew that prescience comes from the, the tinkering of Steve Jobs in his parents' garage. But when you come to legal scholars, they say, well, the received wisdom is that the Supreme Court judges are the most prescient thinkers and that's where the most important thinking is operating. But we actually find evidence to the contrary. And I think that's why it's so interesting is to see that the effect is consistent across all domains. And in some it coheres and in some it is in, entirely antithetical to kind of uh, received wisdom. Um, again, this is the within person model. So we see that as a judge moves from the US district to the US appeals court, uh, 
um, um, their level of prescience and their decisions drops dramatically. The effect is not uh, the same when they move up to the Supreme Court. There are a lot of selection issues here, obviously, um, in who gets selected into the Supreme Court. Uh, but I think it's a very dramatic finding that merely the progression into the U.S. Appeals Court, um, uh, holding your individual fixed rate constant has a negative impact on your vision. And this is the kind of Supreme Court clerking uh, um, effect as we see it uh, dramatically drops um, in terms of your likelihood of being visionary. And finally, in business, we look here not at the individual speakers, but at the Amir, companies that they- I think yes. your slides are, are stuck on division advantage um, in law. Um, which one? Let me, thank you Zoom for doing that. The bar Let graph. me share. The bar graph, okay, let me, I'll reshare and tell me if you can see it again. Can you see it now? No? Mm. Well, Zoom were visionary to predict a pandemic that will require their, but they nevertheless produce a fairly uh, mediocre product. Uh, I'll try to reshare, but uh, the good news is that we basically are almost almost done with the presentation. What I was about to show you um, was um, that basically, um, you know, when we um, look at firm um, size, both in terms of its asset and its number of employees, can you see that my slides now, or are they still? Um, well, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll let I'll let the cache of the Zoom uh, uh, um, deplete for a few seconds. I've had this in the classroom also. Uh, it's not usually an enjoyable process, but um, um, what I was just about to show you is that there is a similar dramatic effect um, for firm size as firms grow in in their size in terms of their assets. So as they become richer, but also as they grow in their size in terms of their um, number of employees, the likelihood of um, producing pressions uh, decreases dramatically. Let me try and share my screen for the last time. Third time success. No, well, I'll, I'll use my slides just so that I can come re read you my conclusions. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, to conclude, um, what I try to demonstrate to you is that uh, it's a useful approach to use deep learning to evaluate vision in free text. Um, that vision is different from success or from innovation. We show you this kind of winner-take-all uh, dynamics such that Prussian thinkers uh, tend to have greater success in politics, greater impact in the law, and to reap greater profits um, uh, in business. But most importantly, that we see across all these domains, despite their dramatic differences, despite the fact that people are operating under very different incentives and that one domain is a free-for-all competition a la business, and the other is highly hierarchical and structured. Still, we see that the general principle holds, which is that vision comes from the periphery, that outsider politicians, lower courts, and smaller firms are the ones who are likely to produce visionary thinking um, in all of these domains. And you know, unfortunately, you won't see my thank you slide that once again, um, uh, you know, uh, sings the praises of uh, of all the students in our. Um, a lab and specifically Paul, uh, who you heard earlier, um, who's really the visionary behind this uh, study. Um, so I want to thank you for, for your patience and for uh, bearing with my technical difficulties here and open it up for any uh, additional questions you might have.